Okay, so uh, we're going to go, go ahead and get started. Um, so this talk is about Maploom. Uh, it's a, a new web client which we developed, which also has integration with GeoGit. Um, <clears throat> so let's uh, explain who we are here. So I'm Cyrus Masagi. I'm the tech lead on, um, on the Rogue project, which it's one of the uh, things that we developed under it is Maploom, essentially. And Tyler here is also one of our senior developers. He's also a committer on Geonode. Um, Okay. Uh, so, quick uh, high level of what we're going to cover. Uh, we're going to talk about um, what Maploom is, uh, what Maploom does, uh, and also we're going to compare it to uh, Geo Explorer uh, to kind of explain why we even decide to write a new client. Um, and also, we're going to point out um, some of the features that happens to have for GeoGit as well, um, and then we'll have a QA and a section um, from there. Okay. Uh, so when we say Maploom, this is what it looks like. Um, what, um, basically, it's an open source uh, web client with capability to edit vector data. Uh, with, and it also has a GeoGit integration. Again, a big important point here is completely open source. Please take it, fork it, contribute back if you want. Um, and the link for it is down on the bottom there. So um, all right. Um, Maploom was developed under uh, the Rogue project. Um, basically, all the capabilities that came out of the project, uh, they're, they're named GeoShape. If you go to geoshape.org, uh, you'll find all kinds of information about everything we developed there. Also, uh, if you go to the GitHub uh, for the rogue organizations, you're going to find everything we developed under. there. Again, all of it is uh, free and open source. A uh, quick idea of what a rogue is, that's so that you can see the context uh, and where Maploom fits in the uh, big picture. Uh, the goal of um, rogue was to, or is to, uh, streamline collaboration on geospatial data between distributed partners. Uh, when we say distributed partners, these can be different organizations. Say you have a government agency or uh, an NGO and, or vol uh, volunteer groups, and uh, you, they have to basically work, work on vector data um, and also then uh, basically pass them around and collaborate on them. So how does it work right now? You end up um, basically, a lot of times people end up getting shape files or KML files and then emailing around, making changes, and it, to get it all back and get everybody on the same page is a complete disaster. So um, unless you have a workflow that tries to help, uh, help with it at best. So um, because of uh, the partners we're talking about here, it's a wide um, a spectrum and also it could be partners from other countries, we have two very important points. One, uh, GeoShape um, has to be completely free and open source. Uh, you know, it kind of eases the export license concerns and also uh, reduces the barrier of entry cost-wise. Uh, for sure, and also has to be easy to deploy. We have uh, scripts where if you want to put up a, a basically a, a rogue node, uh, it'll take you 20 minutes, it'll build a VM with absolutely everything configured, good to go. So, um, so the idea is that each partner, say every uh, organization essentially, it's going to have their own instance of rogue, or GeoShape, I should say. Um, they're going, they can have maps, layers, edit vector data, and so forth. And then they can say, all right, now I want to synchronize. Um, because the um, data can be versioned under the hood, um, basically we're using GeoGit. Actually, GeoGit was um, uh, funded and developed under the Rogue project. Um, we did it in collaboration with uh, Boundless. And um, uh, essentially, because everything is versioned, then you can synchronize with different partners. And you don't have to worry about which version you have, which one you have. You deleted this, you added this. So it's all going to just work. So um, we'll get into more details with that. Um, another big, uh, big uh, focus point for um, Rogue is that it has to work fully and uh, completely when you have no network connectivity. Um, the idea is that um, essentially, uh, if you're in a remote area, uh, working in a remote area, obviously you might not have network connection. The other thing is, um, in a say a disaster scenario, you might not have your uh, communication networks might be either overwhelmed uh, or actually just damaged and down. So, um, this system also includes a, a mobile application. We had a talk on it yesterday, uh, but it, the application is called Arbiter. It's for collecting data. Again, that's free and open source too. Feel free, fork it, do whatever you want, and contribute back if, if you, so you can. Um, all right. So let's just get into a demo, and we're going to talk from here. So what you're going to see here, this website, uh, geoserver2.elementsolutions.com, uh, this is an instance 
of um, GeoShape. Um, and basically, you run a script, it puts everything up, 20 minutes, you have this going. Um, this is a GeoNode, the landing page is GeoNode. Essentially, it's where you're gonna have all your maps and layers, for those who are not familiar with GeoNode. Um, so you have a list of layers, now, this is, now you can go to a list of maps. Um, let's go ahead and create a new map. This now brings, uh, brings up Maploom. Uh, and actually, for anybody who already uses GeoNode, uh, you can easily just add Maploom to replace GeoExplorer if, that's, if you choose to do so. Um, so now we have a map. Let's go ahead and add a um, <clears throat> handful of layers. As you can see, there's a list of servers there. You can add a new one. So by default, it's going to try to bring in layers from the current uh, Geo server that's on, on that instance, or you can just add uh, other Geo server. Um, uh, you know, either it supports WMS and the implicit uh, WFS that goes with it, and also TMS. Okay, but we already have the local server. We'll stick to this. We'll fil filter by layers that are named OD3 at the end. So we're going to add these real quick. Um, by the way, Okay, yeah, so let's go back and uh, we're gonna add, there are some others, uh, for example, if you wanna bring in a hybrid map from Bing, uh, for example, you can, um, uh, you can click there and uh, you can select it from there. So, uh, and also, uh, by the way, when you bring layers from other servers, you can use credentials on different servers accordingly and so forth. So um, now we're gonna reorder this layer because it came up on top. Um, we take it under the feature layers, but we can go ahead and hide it now. Um, okay, so we have a map now. We can actually save it. Um, what essentially happens here, uh, it's gonna save it to GeoNode. So in GeoNode, uh, now if you go to the maps page, you're gonna have one name that you can open it and pick up where you left off essentially. Um, <clears throat> so the, uh, you have a bunch of features here um, on this map. Let's go ahead and um, basically do a feature info um, on, on one to see. Um, uh, what it has. So this particular one looks like network connection is a little bit slow, but it's coming. Um, so this uh, particular feature we clicked on happens to have a photo associated with it. Uh, so it's the first one that comes up. Um, the idea is, by the way, this was uh, the mobile app arbiter was used to collect this. Um, um, but um, essentially, yeah, if, if, you're, if the uh, specific um, feature type you have has a column called photos, you know, then there's a certain way you can put it in and the client will show it. Um, also, you see a list of attributes there in the below the photos. Um, those are all the attributes and all the values uh, that it has. And uh, let's go ahead and just make a quick, uh, create a quick little feature, real quick. As you can see, we just click on the corresponding layers pencil button. We click it, either points, line, or polygons, multi polygons, multi line, etc. Uh, you can create it. Uh, we have uh, drop downs here, for example, like Grado Danio is the uh, you know, the severity of damage, grade of damage, we can say it's severe. Um, and um, we have different widgets uh, there, for example, the date, uh, time. Basically, we use the schema that GeoServer has uh, to try to say, okay, um, it's going to be a date field or number or string. And, um, and, and also, the drop downs were actually pulling from there as well. Um, all right, so we go ahead and save this particular feature. And there you go. Um, you can edit it, so we're going to open it back up. Um, make another change to it, whatever it be, okay. Um, so now that we'd actually have looked at, um, just so we've taken a quick look at this, let's take a, a quick pause here. Let's go to Geo Explorer, and I wanna explain why it is that we decided to write a client. So uh, for the first year of the project, we actually did a lot of work based on um, uh, Geo Explorer. Uh, we added a lot of functionalities to it to basically suit our needs. Um, but when we went to our operational demo, we had a bunch of users, we did evaluations and so forth, and based on the comments we got back, uh, we were 100% sure as opposed to 90% sure that we definitely need to uh, write a new client. And a uh, quick example, we have a layer here, or we have a map here with two layers. Um, first thing users do, they click to see what's going on, you get absolutely nothing. So um, you have to know where the identify button is to then go be there and click on it to then just be able to pull up some basic information uh, about the particular feature. So um, that's one of the big problems we had. Second, um, second problem is um, when you go to actually create a new feature, um, it's quite uh, clunky. First, first of all, you have to have the right uh, layer already selected. And a lot of times people click on create, not realizing which layer they were on, and they'll drop a point, fill out some stuff, then, then all of a sudden they realize, oh, they have to completely redo it on the right layer. So that was another um, issue that we had. And uh, thirdly, um, on this screen, it's not too small, it's not bad, but look at all the white space that we, you know, we couldn't really uh, do anything with. Um, 
And uh, actually, uh, credit due here is last year uh, at Phosphor G, uh, the GeoAdmin guys, they were doing a talk on uh, their client, and we saw that they had basically something along these lines on the, on the left side, and we're like, oh, that actually uh, looks quite good. Uh, good, so we're kind of uh, basically partially inspired by them. Um, and, um, but it's the code bases that are not the same for, for many different reasons. We actually looked into that, but uh, we, a lot of changes need to be made. So, and uh, so anyhow, on the right-hand side there also, we have our legend, which we can go ahead and collapse uh, to get more real estate. Open Layers 3 comes with a full screen option with a couple of changes or a couple of considerations on our end for our dialogues, and now you're full screen and look at all the real estate you have, and it, it's really a big difference when you compare it to GeoExplorer. And actually, the, another quick thing, so if you zoom out a little bit, in, um, if you do have, um, if you click on part of the map where you have multiple features, um, the idea is just let people click on the map and deal with it from there. So uh, if you click here, it says, hey, there are three features in that spot. Or if you have multiple features from different layers, so let's zoom out even one more step, that way there's a lot of overlap. Um, what it does is that it says, hey, which layer you're talking about? I have data in these ones. And you can go th click on it, and then you can even go back and, and so forth, walk through them. So at least makes it a little bit, um, uh, a little bit easier there. So um, OK. Um, so we've, uh, we've talked about this. So let's go ahead and uh, take a look at uh, our layers now. OK. Um, so we're going to talk about what we have um, here under the layers. Oh, here's a zoom to data button, really straightforward. You click, it takes all the data that, that's part of the uh, particular layer that you're doing zoom to data on. Uh, we're, we're clicked on vulnerability data structural, so it's zoomed out to include all those. Um, we have other buttons there as well, so there's a, a table view. So you can click this table view, uh, you can filter it, uh, and also you can um, edit uh, with that. So you look for anything that says uh, Fuerte Lever Damage and then you can hit actually edit here. So let's say you want to say all my features that have this value for this column, I want to go update a certain thing. You can just uh, do, them, do them here uh, and also uh, it's paginated and everything. So if you're dealing with a lot of features, it's still manageable. Uh, the other thing is is that um, you can actually jump to the map here from you see a particular one, you're like, yep, I want to see where this one is. And we're going to wait for the connection here to catch up, um, but there you go, okay. So um, next uh, we have another button on there, we're going to skip the clock one for, for a time being, we're going to put next to it, on a given layer uh, you can actually uh, click on this uh, information button, okay. So if we click on the information layer, this gives you information about um, that particular layer. Uh, what the actual name is, what title is, which workspace, obviously those could be different. Um, and if you go to the very bottom, uh, first of all you see the URL because sometimes you have layers from this geo server, they could be from uh, remote ones, but an important thing here it says on the bottom you have a, uh, this layer happens to have a repo and a branch uh, parameter. So uh, th this means that this particular layer is backed by GeoGit. Um, you could have layers obviously up uh, backed as a, with a shapefile or with PostGIS. Um, this particular one, when we went in GeoNode and we uploaded the layer, we did a quick little check mark that says, hey, instead of by default put it into PostGIS, uh, put it into GeoGit. And uh, that gives us uh, all kinds of good, good options, which we're going to cover uh, in a second here as well. So let's go and click on a feature. Um, we have a handful of buttons here. The table is the same one we showed, but it'll actually uh, select that feature when it opens up. Uh, but there's a history button there. So let's click on history. Uh, here, this, this basically, because uh, this data store, um, it's, it's not posters, it's not, uh, it's not shapefile, it's GeoGit, so it shows all the commits that have touched uh, this particular feature. Uh, so for those of you who are you know, familiar with version, uh, version control software, um, it's the same thing. So we have all these commits, you can see which user touched it, when they touched them. Uh, the, the color on the, uh, on the side, if you, see a if you see yellow, that means that particular commit this one says that particular commit, all the com uh, features in there are modifications, as opposed to greens are adds or uh, reds are removes. Um, so uh, let's, and yeah, you can see information about commit ID and author and, and, and so forth. Let's click on it. And um, so now this one's, when we clicked on it, this opens up the commit, says um, that feature was modified in this particular commit. We're like, what, what was in that commit? 
uh, it only has one feature. If you have 50 features committed at once, you'll see the rest of them listed as well. So now we could say we either see it on the map, which we're looking at it, so we're good, or we can say let's go ahead and show changes. Uh, when we bring up show changes, uh, it's essentially a diff. Um, you have a map on the left-hand side. Um, what you could see here is that um, the green uh, or highlighted field for that matter, the yellow one says it used to be Casa Mortal and now it's Otro. So um, it's just doing a diff for you there, saying what changed. So we have a button on the bottom that says show uh, authors. So you can actually uh, see out of the, the snapshot of the feature that you're looking at right now, uh, which user contributed which values. Because obviously over time, um, you know, you could have different people contributing to it. And there you see an example. Um, that field was contributed by uh, Crisis, whereas the one below it was Santa Domingo 4. Uh, and you can see information on it there. Um, we actually have a, another a button here that says undo change. So you brought up a snapshot the same way in, uh, with Git, with subversion and so forth, you can try to undo a change. If you just say revert, essentially we're saying now we see what this particular change was. Uh, we want to go ahead and, um, or actually we'll do it a little bit later. We'll come back and undo it when we're synchronizing. So okay, but that's the idea, cool. Um, Okay, so uh, let's, um, let's see. So let's go ahead and uh, now uh, do a quick uh, synchronization test for you. We have two tabs across the top. Um, let's, uh, could you show both tabs, uh, Tyler? So it's hard for you to see, but look at the URL addresses up there. They do change. Uh, this particular one says dev.rogue.elmansolutions.com. The other tab uh, says GeoServer2. These are both two different GeoShape instances. Again, you run a script, stands up everything that you've seen so far. We have two different ones. On the one particular one, uh, let's go on GeoServer. Oh, oh uh, did you already have? Uh, yeah, so notice here in that area, we don't have anything. Let's go to the other tab. Um, this is where Tyler created a feature, so it's red. Um, this is basically, to pause for a second, what you're seeing here is a, 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 imagine having two different organizations or two different volunteer groups or whatever it be. Uh, one of them has their data on their server, they've been wo working, they have some data now. The other tab represents another uh, organization or partner. Now we want to sync our data with them. Um, so what happens is um, you basically uh, can add remotes the same way a Git has remotes, GeoGit has the same concept, and for the developers, really quick. Um, so GeoGit doesn't really use Git, is a complete rewrite, actually has to deal with a uh, couple more non-trivial complications, but um, the idea is pretty much the same. So we have remotes, the command line interface actually is quite similar to Git. Um, so we've just done a synchronization from our end, and actually from GeoServer 2, uh, we decided to uh, do a sync to the other server. You could obviously d uh, do it the other way as around. Uh, so, and as you can see, uh, it's there. Actually, there's a notification section up there. Uh, one of them says it's about this. So if you look on the history here, uh, it says that it was created at uh, 1.07 uh, p.m. by uh, Garner TV. So uh, that's the synchronization. Now, um, so imagine um, you have a uh, repository, a GeoGit repository. A GeoGit repository is the same as a database. A database can have a lot of tables. A GeoGit repository can also have a lot of layers. So you make a repo, you put layers that you consider relevant in there, and the other partners clone the same repo. Now you start making your changes. You work on it, say, for one day, two days, two months, uh, and then somebody else clones from them, make whatever changes, undo some things. They keep going on and on. At some point, you want to sync. So um, what we did is we were able to sync, uh, and basically automatically, Anything that can be resolved automatically uh, gets resolved and merged in. So you don't have to go worry about, it knows, well, this person changed this version, so that means this can get merged, no problem. Uh, there are cases where uh, you can have conflicts, though. It's actually rare. A conflict is a situation where you have two different um, servers, or two different organizations for that matter, changing the same exact feature and the same exact attribute of the feature, setting it to different values. Um, if you, uh, so in this case, uh, Tyler essentially set, um, sorry, let's look at this really quick again. Uh, Tyler set the, um, the name of the property to GeoServer2. That's because he's on GeoServer2. Uh, and um, on the other one, he changes the same exact feature, the same exact um, uh, basically attribute. We change it to dev server. So now when you go to do a synchronization, um, so let's, yeah, we're gonna do a synchronization. Um, it's gonna come back and says, uh, you know, we have a conflict, do you wanna just forget about it now or do you wanna deal with it? We say, let's go ahead and uh, resolve conflict. 
This brings up um, all the features that have, are now in conflict because of the synchronization we did. We've only uh, played with one feature, but you know, if you had two different servers that were uh, not synchronizing with each other for a week and a lot of people working on it, you could have a lot of conflicts potentially if exact same things happen. And I'm going to pause real quick and say that uh, usually if you have people in the field collecting data, you can avoid conflicts with a little bit of process, uh, with your process, you know, uh, figure out who works in what area. But let's say you get conflicts, you come here and uh, you can see the changes for this particular one. Uh, so good old three-way marriage. Uh, so the left one says local. Local is GeoServer 2. Uh, as you can see, the name of the map on top says local. The, the, the one on the far right, the, the map, uh, the title says dev. That's the other uh, instance. And the center one is the results. We're going to scroll down to try to see where, what happened here. Okay, it's essentially saying the name of the property, the left one said is GeoServer2. The other person says uh, it's dev server. It by default took dev server, but you can switch that real quick. You can click on that arrow and say, no, take this one versus the other one. And actually, uh, there are cases where um, and there is a, uh, we have the show author on the bottom. You might say, hey, let me see who contributed these because if I know who's contributing on the other end, I might as well, you know, because their reputation or known what the organization, or which person it is, decide to resolve it with theirs as it being a little more authoritative. Uh, so, all right, so now we save it. And, um, and, and we're essentially done now. And it comes back and we synchronized. We have all our layers and everything's good to go. So I'm going to pause. Go ahead. What happens if you have attributes from two different agencies, one of which you like from here and the other which you like from here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can. It's not a whole feature thing. And actually, um, uh, just to add to that really quick too. So let's say, um, uh, yeah. In that case, you'll go one at a time and say which one you want. And actually, you can even type in what you would have instead of both of them, because maybe one of them calls it Casa uh, Blanca, one of them calls it uh, White House. But one, it, you could be like, well, they meant really this. This is actually good. So you could you could go with that. And uh, one other thing, uh, you can have uh, conflicts in geometry as well, right? Somebody could move a point this way, the other one uh, move it that way. Imagine a road. A road could have a conflict because it's a long feature. Uh, actually, if you if one user ends uh, ends up editing one end of it, uh, the other organization edits the other end. Um, that's actually not a conflict. Is reliably uh, resolvable. So, but if they touch the same uh, areas, then it's like, okay, now I, I need a, uh, a person in the loop. And in that case, in the three-way merge, you essentially, right now we have it, you pick which one geometry you want. So otherwise you have to put edit controls all in there and, and make it all useful there as well. So, um, okay, so that's actually um, time-wise where we got uh, time um, for questions and we can talk as much as you want. So um, any questions? Anybody have questions? Go ahead. GeoGig is, uh, Geo is currently uh, in 1.0 beta 1. Um, what shortcomings have you seen from that um, as far as uh, stuff that's not done yet? Or? Sure. Um, so we've actually been using uh, GeoGit, GeoGit, rightfully GeoGig, um, because it got renamed because of uh, naming concerns. But nevertheless, uh, we have, uh, we've been using it since day one, right? We actually have, uh, uh, core, core developers that have been working at in our office on it as well. So um, anything that needed to be resolved, it's resolved for us to be able to do the th things we want to. So uh, we definitely call it uh, fully functional. And um, so um, it's, it's completely fully functional. There, you can say, I can't say there's absolutely no bugs or anything like that. I think I filed a couple, uh, uh, you know, just a week before last. But, um, but I would consider it functional. Now, but I'm going to follow on to your question and say, um, should everybody then put, start using GeoGit and put all their data in GeoGit? Um, the answer is actually no. Um, depends on what you're dealing with, right? PostGIS uh, is optimized for performance. It's, it's hard to beat um, you know, data in PostGIS performance-wise. Um, but if you want to optimize purely for performance, you put it in PostGIS. If you actually want to optimize for history and merging and all that other stuff, yeah, you put it in GeoKit essentially. So, um, so I hope you answer your, I answer your question. Sure, I'm going to run the microphone here if you don't mind. So you mentioned that you know GeoGit isn't PostGIS; it's its own thing. So, uh, um, sorry, I'm drawing a blank. Um, so, do you have tools for like how do you get your data out of GeoGit, like export? Sure. 
Silly. Okay, so um, so let's uh, actually uh, we can show on um, quickly on the upload page. First of all, let's talk about getting data into it, right? So um, the easiest way to get data into it is if you happen to use GeoNode, uh, which you don't have to, it's a command line import. You can bring in from shapefile, from PostGIS, uh, whatever it be. But the easiest way is uh, we can have. Uh, I'm sorry. Do you want me to actually do one? Um, sure, if you're feeling brave, we have time, so that's good. Uh, so. Um, what happens is that you can upload data to GeoNode, and during import, you say, hey, I just please don't put it in, in post, just, just put it in GeoGit. That's for import. For export, same thing works. It, GeoGit is just a data store, right? And it's got the data store kind of wrapper for it, which is exposed uh, through GeoServer. If you go into GeoServer, we'd actually maybe we could do that too. Um, if you type a new name there, that's just making a new uh, GeoGit repository right there, which, what does the GeoGit repository look like? It's a folder with a .geogit. Uh, or I should start saying GeoGig, but nah, it's going to be hard to keep that. But it's going to say .geogit folder, and you're going to have everything in there. And it's very similar to how uh, Git itself is set up. I mean, heavily inspired, obviously. So, um, and um, sorry, I missed. Did you already upload it on everything? Yeah, All right, there you go. Uploaded it, and I'll load it into Mapplum real quick as well. Okay. So it brought it into Mapplum, and um, if you make an edit now. Um, that's a serious polygon. Do you want to try it? <laughs> <laughs> with the attribute. <laughs> All right, good. <laughs> so, um, uh, but yeah, so he's going to edit on that attribute there, and then say, and then you could, you'll have the history. So, um, does that answer your question? Well, then how do you export it? Sure. Thank you very much. So, uh, if you go just to the in GeoNode, uh, the easy way, you just go to a particular layer, and you have all the options to pull it down, however you want. And actually, um, let's can we. Um, so, all right, guys, let me do a quick announcement since technically we're, that's, uh, we have four minutes. But um, next presenter here for next talk, I hear the, okay. All right, so if the person doesn't come, we'll keep, we can keep talking. Uh, sounds like they haven't picked up their registration or their pass, so they're, they're probably not here. So, um, but um, I want to show something really quick. Um, and if any, any of you guys have to leave because of your next talk, by all means do. Uh, so let's go into Maplum real quick. If you want to export the history of changes that was done in a layer between two different times as an Excel file, you can actually do that too. Um, and I'll uh, let uh, Tyler give that a shot. But, um, but yeah, you could, you could bring up stuff, just say for this repo in this time range, what changed, and it tell you which user what and all that stuff. So basically give you a log of that. Um, next question? Sure. Yeah, um, speaking of serious polygons, where do you see the limitations? It may be a combined question to GeoGig and uh, Maplum. The limitations size-wise, how big would the data sets be that you still edit? Yeah, thank you very much. So, uh, good question. Um, so, um, definitely when you put data into GeoGit, it takes up a lot more space. I mean, because Guess, I mean, obviously it's keeping track of all the history and it needs the canonical representations and stuff. So it, the size goes up really quick, right? Um, however, um, I mean, you want to try it in that polygon? I don't think that's yeah. actually, a, uh, I, honestly, I wasn't as concerned about uh, GeoGit on that one. It's like sometimes, actually it's our laptop, so uh, yeah, here we, we'll give this a shot. But it, we shouldn't have any, uh, really, if this has problems, open layers three edit controls is what's making the edits, right? So I, that's actually was my my concern. Um, and um, did it work by any chance? Or? Uh, I, didn't, I didn't want to do it that far as zoomed out. So. Oh, okay, yeah, so <laughs> that's fine. But I wouldn't say, uh, so if this space is not a concern for you, I wouldn't be too concerned. Uh, however, it depends. If you're gonna put all the roads in OSM for all, um, you're definitely pushing it. So I think we had we had a repo with scripts we ran with about 300,000 uh, commits on there. And it, the problem is that it's not that it doesn't work, but uh, you could get to the point where some of your requests are just getting lo uh, getting longer and your requests might time out for, depending on what type of things you're doing. So um, if you have a specific example of your type of data, I can give you my personal opinion for whatever is worth after this. So. Uh, um, for, for what again? I get all the roads for a country or something. Um, I, w I would try it, and if it works, I'll, I'll keep using it. <laughs> However, um, do you really need to have it all versioned? Because, again, it, has, it comes with overhead, right? It's, it's good for some things, less good for other things. So, um, Again, guys, quick announcement for those of you who are just coming in. Looks like the presenter that was supposed to be in this room, uh, it's not here. So um, we're going to continue to take questions. Um, if you if you happen to have um, any questions, so.
No problem, guys. Sure. Um, did, did you mention how you then get it back into, say, post GIS? Okay. So um, our workflow is uh, that for the data that we want history on, we bring it into PostGIS. Uh, I'm sorry, we bring it into GeoGit and we'll leave it there. Um, however, if you do want to take it out in PostGIS, their command line uh, operations would, would, would let you, that will let you export. So you could even, the, the terrible workaround would be, you could even download it from Geonode and then push it into the other one if you want to in PostGIS. So the, I, um, the, if, when you take it out of GeoGit, again, you're stripping all of that history too, right? So if you just want to bring it out to do some analysis because you have some stuff set up in PostGIS, sure, do it that way. But then uh, you have to be careful to then not start making changes there, somebody making changes, and all that out of business. But yeah. Does that answer your question at all? Yeah. Uh, okay. It replicated in PostGIS, you mean? Or um, if you just know uh, the, all the history stuff, it, when you export to PostGIS, a, a, you're exporting a particular snapshot, right? You can say, hey, for this commit, this is I'm exporting, and it goes there. Yeah, no, no. Yeah, and you just take that out. Yeah, that's completely doable. Okay, cool. Did we have a question over there? Sure. So is there not a way to export the snapshot? So it sounded like the way you're storing it in GeoGit, um, you're storing the full feature um, history, not just uh, the diff. Uh, so there's not a way to export it based on a primary key and see the differences over time okay. for each record. Okay. So um, actually, uh, let's, let's look. You can actually do diffs, first of all. Um, and so if you want to see the history of how things changed over time exactly, but you only want to see the diffs. Um, the full. So basically, if you go to any particular snapshot, you'll see exactly what there was, right? And you can actually do diffs here. So uh, for example, uh, let's go ahead and, um, yeah, so basically when you, when you open up uh, any of these features and you're looking at the diffs, um, you can actually, you're, you can, uh, we're, we're displaying what the diff actually is. You know what I mean? So you can see it. I think I'm missing your question, quite honestly. So. Okay, uh, only the diffs or exact snapshots all along the way? Okay, so if you want to do all snapshots all along the way, you're sp essentially exporting a specific commit. So you could. You want to add to this, Jody? In WFS 2.0, feature IDs split into two. So you got the feature ID and the revision ID. So when we tie this into GeoServer, given funding, we'll be able to report back your edit history on a feature. More questions? All right. By the way, I don't know if I mentioned that basically this, this client is using Angular. I can actually get into details about So you mentioned there's the the Arbiter mobile client. Is that like a is that a native a Android app and uh, and that's fully open source for developers too? Absolutely everything we developed under here is open source. Uh, and yes, uh, we we actually developed. We had a talk on this yesterday. We ended up developing two mobile apps. We had the first version was Cordova, um, and we uh, or PhoneGap based, I should say, um, and we used um, uh, essentially uh, jQuery for the UI. Uh, the problem we had with that is jQuery and Cordova ran great on the iOS simulator, ran great on iOS. You took it on Android, there was these extra flickers here and there, and pauses, and all kinds of weird nuances. Uh, so. Um, then we were like two and a half months away from another major deadline, so we're like, okay, we're gonna write another one. So we did a more native version. And when I say more native, that's only because you're using a JS library, you can only go so native, right? So uh, it's a JavaScript library, so you're still running a web view, um, but all our UI was, 99% uh, of our UI was native. So that made it re uh, look a lot better and function a lot better, more responsive, et cetera. Um, and yes, they are both available. If you go to the Rogue uh, JCTD um, uh, organization, there are two Arbiter ones. Make sure you don't grab the wrong one. Arbiter is the first one. Arbiter Android is the second one we have. So the first one, um, uh, I mean, 
actually, we might as well make comments. We have time on this. So another uh, app, we kind of uh, we essentially made the uh, Pushpin OSM uh, app as well. We used PhoneGap for it and OpenLayers 3. Um, just a couple of the guys, when they had free cycles here and there, they worked on it. So it's not definitely, it's not complete, but it's functioning. Um, and that one uses Bootstrap with OL3. Uh, OL3 is much uh, lighter and um, uh, overall everything is running uh, quite reasonably there. Um, so um, I, the only reason I say this, I don't want you to scare you away, I don't want to scare you away from only phone gap solutions. So uh, with the, our problem was the combination happened to not work and there it actually turned, did turn out to be bugs. So uh, if you go with Bootstrap and say all three or Leaflet or whatever, you should be perfectly fine. However, it's not gonna feel as solid as a native app. As you're running a web, web view is a web view. So um, let's do all, okay, sure. Do you feel that presently uh, GeoGit would be um, capable of handling millions of features, um, but being able to filter it by time? So is there a way that you can temporally bound the Okay, so tem Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> okay, so millions of features. Um, we've, uh, one of the repos with scripts, we're generating stuff. Uh, we had uh, 300,000 commits. Um, Commits is what end up costing more than actual features, right? So uh, if you end up having one commit with a million feature, you're actually going to be just fine. Um, however, how many commits you're going to have after that and, and, and so forth. Um, now, as far as uh, being able to filter by time, um, right now we're not uh, doing anything temporal. Um, Map Story obviously has had interest uh, dealing with temporal data and making sure everything runs perfectly fine there. Uh, we were actually... Uh, we had a, um, we were trying to line up with Map Story and kind of complement each other's work, but things kind of schedule-wise didn't quite work out. However, that is something that Ian is working, uh, Ian with Balance is working on. It has to get working, and it will be working. So, uh, and I don't want to say that it doesn't work now, but I can't tell give you any numbers where I can feel comfortable saying that yeah, I've done that. This is how it runs. So, um, bottom line of it is, um, if you have millions of feature. Um, you have temporal data, you have d enough disk space, enough memory, I, I believe you should be fine. Um, so there's not like an index concern? Oh, no, no, it's not an index concern. It is a resource concern, though. Like, things are definitely larger. They, and if it's something is larger on disk, it's gonna, probably going to be larger in memory, right? So, and you're pulling all the history as well. So uh, you're essentially the, uh, when you start to have a lot of data in or a lot of commits, um, you en end up getting to the point where your responses could be taking longer than you'd like to. Now, um, w one of the stuff that uh, we were able to get in, um, Gabriel with uh, Boundless, they essentially, um, we, we have it so when you commit uh, using WFST um, and the, uh, the data back, or the data store backend is, is GeoGit, it does, and you do syncs and merges and all this stuff, it triggers uh, to invalidate the tiles so that you can it can basically trigger uh, invalidating them. So next time they get generated, then from there on they're cached again. Uh, so I did file a bug about that recently, but nevertheless, they, it, 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 we have put uh, effort there for sure. Uh, and uh, so if you have a lot of features not changing a lot all the time, and then you're okay with having cached data, you should be fine again. So you know, it's just gotta work, get the right balance there. Uh, app, yeah, it, it's WMS slash WFS. Uh, well, so let's go back. Um, it's, it's both of the abo above, right? So what you're looking at right now is WMS as soon as you start editing WFS. So, um, okay, more questions? Sure. Are you using any uh, unique resource identifiers for linking to changes, linking to map areas uh, within Maploom? Like if I want to tell my colleague, hey, I did this edit number 315. And to be able to look it up? All right, so you want to be able to make an edit. Well, there's a commit ID, right? Hey, can we hit the REST API or REST endpoint up there? Um, not that anybody should jump to this necessarily, but uh, let's just flat out go to, um, uh, to the, uh, go to slash, we'll go to ge forward slash geo server up there. And then after we go to the geo git endpoint. That essentially you can run geo git commands on there because it's a REST dish uh, uh, API. <laughs> so I am, um, 
So actually, just go to the GeoGit one. That's fine. Just, just let's go there. Let's enumerate, see what's there. So, all right. Now we're on GeoServers. So um, we, on GeoServers, GeoGit REST API, right? And those are the repositories, of, uh, repositories available. We're going to pick on the one we were, uh, one of the ones we we're dealing with, um, and then we can say log, right? So. If you just, now this is flat out your, your, your log, right? So uh, I would say what you would do is, the question is, can you give somebody a commit ID and then have them bring it up really quick? And the short answer is no. Sorry for the long detour. However, with a little bit of change, you can make the history panel just have a filter because uh, getting it from the REST API, no problem. It is it done in two seconds, right? Um, but then having it on the map and everything, um, we just have to, you just have to make it uh, so that the, the history panel, maybe put a little thing there where somebody can type in part of the commit hash and hit enter and it comes up and you show it. So it would need some change, but I'm pretty sure you'd be able to do it in a day. So, oh, so all right, cool. Uh, questions? Sure. All right, this is good. So I, I was in a talk earlier that was kind of about Maplume. Um, I never got, though, um, on the devices, you know, on the Android app, what are you storing the data in? The, the guy said that it wasn't in GeoGit, so are you using spatial light? Or? Uh, yeah, so uh, do you want to, uh, we can bring up the uh, emulator, that's kind of brave, but do you want to give that a shot real quick and close anything else I have open? Uh, so, um, all right, so let's see. So the quick the question is, um, we showed the, uh, the mobile device that we use for data collection, and um, so the idea of it is that you can actually, um, you specify uh, a, an area of interest and on a map, and what it does is you say, all right, make a project for this. You add layers and so forth. It takes all of the tiles in that area, and it takes all the vector features in that area, puts them all on the device. And your question is, well, when you edit it there, what happens? You know, where is it stored? Yes, the short, uh, the short answer would have been uh, to say that, uh, that yeah, it, we use uh, SQLite essential, uh, essentially to have them just in a database. So uh, we just flag things that, hey, it was edited, it was edited, and so forth. So we keep track of all of those. And then when you go to synchronize this, um, the, the mobile device, when you have connectivity again, when you go to synchronize with the server, uh, it says, hey, um, these are the change ones. It makes a WFS, uh, FST post that way and, and goes from there. Now, you might ask, how do you make sure uh, versioning and everything is completely cool there? Uh, that would be a very good question. Um, and the answer to it is that um, we didn't want people to have to deal with conflict resolution on a mobile device, right? When you have a three-way merge, it's already ugly enough anywhere, right? So um, we ended up going with a, also because of time constraints, like going with a, a last last person wins on the mobile device. And that might sound terribly bad, but when people are out in the field and making changes, um, if there is some process to say which area you work, uh, like a tasking manager or something along those lines, um, then you'll be just fine. Um, however, if you really, really want to try to be sure, uh, you could probably do something along, something along the lines where um, you, when you pull the data, get the commit ID at which point you got the data, when you go to sync, um, basically um, make a transaction, get it merged, go from there. If there is no conflict, pan fantastic. Everything now gets in and nobody stomps on anybody's anything. Um, but um, if there is a conflict, only take out the few features that probably were in conflict because far majority of it shouldn't be in conflict. And put those on a branch, get everything else in, and then let somebody on a web client deal with any ones that happen to have conflict. Um, we haven't. Uh, Jody uh, has Justin ran GeoGit on a mobile. I know at some point there was some bare like remote talk about it, but <laughs> okay, fair enough. Uh, so um, I know there were initially there were some talks for it. Honestly, uh, if I had if we had to do it all over again, knowing what we know today, I still wouldn't put GeoGit uh, on a mobile device just because you have to think about it. I mean, it's it's more resources, you know, and on a mobile device, the last thing you have too much to spare is resources. So, okay, questions? Sure. Um, could you just say a little about developing with Angular and OL3? All right. So. Uh, Back to 
where we were. So la last year, Phosphor G went to a talk, and uh, the GeoAdmin, a gentleman with GeoAdmin uh, working on a GeoAdmin project, did the demonstration, which we kind of inspired by the smaller menu on site. Um, um, uh, let's see. Um, so we, we basically saw that, and they were like, yeah, we're using Bootstrap, all three, and, um, and Angular. So we went back, and we decided that, OK, we need to change it. We need a different client. None of us know Angular, and, but it's going to happen. And we had two and a half months to not have the full everything, but actually put it in front of people to replace GeoExplorer for sure. So the bare minimum functionality had to be there. Um, the, uh, the, learning, uh, the learning curve on, uh, on Angular is not trivial. Uh, and the, what the cool thing is, when we didn't know, we were fine. We were like, no, we definitely got this. And you would get to some point, you're like, what? And uh, all, we, two, three times we went through this where we were like, no, we completely got it. So it has a ramp up time for sure. Uh, however, um, we would have exactly done it the same way all over again, even with a small time frame. Because once you get going, um, it is so nice. Things are so modular. I mean, if you go in GeoExplorer and you try to make any changes, just make the Lord have mercy on your soul because it, its user experience is one thing, but the one inside, it, it's, it's, it's rough because you got an API wrap with another API, half the stuff you want. It's not exposed, how it's here, and things are not modular enough, or you have to dig so deep. Uh, we're, we would have done it completely exactly the same thing all over again. So, questions? All right. Sure. Oh, concerned about the sun skin. <laughs> so, uh, Geo Git is now Geo Gig, etc. But uh, there was a bunch of experiments in the code base with different database backends. Can you give me any comments on that? Because like there was graph databases yeah, and yeah. all this crazy stuff. Did you try any of it? Yeah, sure. So, all right. And uh, J I would have loved J for JD to be here. He's probably I think watching it live, so he can. He's smiling right now. Happy that he's not here, but. I'm just kidding. But um, so, um, all right, so we experiment a lot with GeoGit. So uh, what you see working right now to meet our or, or meet our functionality, uh, we've gone through a lot of changes. So when we're talking about a graph database, let me address that really quick. Then we'll talk about the database stuff. Um, so uh, internally, we kind of needed a, we started the project with the need to be able to say, hey, I have this repository, it's humongous. I want to chunk out this area, go work, have version control, and then sync and everything work like there's no problems ever. Um, but the sub uh, basically uh, get portion of the data and still be a fully functional um, repository. And so we're shooting quite high, right? Right. <laughs> so, and um, yeah, Git, Git itself, uh, you know, even has uh, that stuff took some while. We tur it turned out that they were doing some work towards that. But um, um, essentially, um, we had to represent a graph of all the history of what uh, previous commits are, and we used that to try to do uh, concepts of shallow clone. You know, where you say, all right, uh, I have a repository here. Um, and then um, it has a thousand co uh, commits in its history. I only want to get the last three or the last hundred. We end up employing that with a graph database and also uh, doing partial clones to try to do only subsections and so forth. And in this process, we switched many times because um, uh, JD wrote uh, all these algorithms to try to figure out uh, how to get these right. And even when we were talking through this, trying to get them straight, um, there are still a reasonable amount of problems. But the long answer to your short question is that uh, we've gone through changing the graph database back in a bunch of times, but um, it's, it's good now. Um, however, the other question that I would love for um, actually um, Michael Wiseman, if he was here, I'd love him to, maybe he could have given a better answer to this, is actually changing the, the back end of what we're using. So right now we're using Berkeley DB um, uh, to store all, all the features. Um, so, and I know that uh, basically Boundless has put some time into uh, trying to replace it with Mongo to try to make things uh, more scalable. Um, but quite honestly, I don't have any performance metrics that I can tell you we're doing this, change it to this, or it didn't. But uh, it should definitely be more scalable, but I don't have any update to give on that. So, all right. More question, guys? All right. We're going to start charging you after this one. Did you have a question, or no, you're just crazy? <laughs> no, please do, by the way. I'm just kidding. I mean, sure, please. Okay, so uh, I've never really used Geonode, but um, is there ways to, like, 
you know, is there the concept of roles? Like, say, if I set up GeoNode for, uh, you know, we manage firefighters data, or, and we allow them to log into a website to edit it. Would there be a way for me to, you know, be a super user, but then say, hey, these people can log in and view their data and edit this data in this location? Or something? Yeah, thank you so much. I'm going to let I'm going to let you answer, but answer. Uh huh. Yeah, the answer is yes. Yeah. So, Do you want to uh, show it really quick? It. Yeah. So, and actually, uh, he used to be a firefighter too, and we're doing some firefighter related work. So actually, we'll get your information. Yeah, we should in touch base after this. Yeah. So. Yeah, well. So, all right, cool. So the, uh, so the question so, was, actually, we never talked about layer permissions, right? So um, l what if I have a repository, but I don't want certain people changing certain things, so you uh, bring things on a map? Uh, in GeoNode, you can easily change permissions. Um, so you can essentially open a layer, and you can say, hey, this, uh, anyone can see it. That is somebody that's not even authenticated, uh, or an only registered user can see it, or you can say a group can see it. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the groups we have there. Yeah, so um, we'll go to the group page. Um, and uh, so, Yeah, this is explicitly listing users who have access to edit the data, and then also you can do it for groups. And so every request that comes through, it looks specifically at that user and whether they're, um, they have access either explicitly themselves or they're in a group that has access to that data. Um, in GeoServer, uh, it dispatches its authentication and authorization logic to GeoNode. So as soon as you change it in here, uh, GeoServer automatically will uh, change the way it serves up the data, right? So it'll say, this user came and see a Git capabilities request. They don't know that this layer exists. Um, a Git map request would return a 404 for that user, but a user who does have access to it would get the 200 and actually see the layer uh, and the Git capabilities, so no problem. All right, guys, looks like we have nine minutes before this gentleman has to present. So go ahead. Does, does uh, GeoNode play nice with uh, single sign-on? Okay. Like uh, kind of. So it's written in Django, so you can easily Could you change. repeat the question just for the recording? Um, yeah, so the question was about changing the authentication in GeoNode. Uh, GeoNode uses a uh, Django as a web framework, and you can easily change the authentication to LDAP uh, or remote user authentication, which is probably what you'd want for a single sign-on, right? Um, is that right? Or well, oh, yeah, which is a remote user, and you can change that environmental variable to whatever you want. So uh, yeah, it's really easy in Django. Uh, I would say that we're using the GeoNode 2.0 release, which had custom permissions in it, and since then we've changed to a much higher level library that uh, will allow you to do that. But this version of GeoNode right here won't. So in other words, uh, the one that's in master right now works 100%, it's one line of code for you to change and you're good to go. This one, you would have to customize it to, to make it work. So uh, I think we're gonna release that version uh, early next year, so, uh, or late this year, so. But you can at least grab it and test it, uh, but it should be a one-liner for you uh, if everything works out right. Cool. All right, more question, guys? We've still got five minutes. <laughs> All right, so, uh, well, uh, Thanks, guys. Go to our, uh, please go to the, uh, put up the GitHub page again. Please go there, fork anything you want, uh, and, um, uh, you know, please commit or contribute back. We'd be more than happy uh, to ha answer any questions. Open up issues on there and then harass him, harass me. Um, depends on what kind it is, you know, I'm just kidding. So, um, but yeah, thank you very much.